I'm assuming that Gre Gregory and Graham don't need much of an introduction, but yet, you know, uh, we, we, we know the, their work with cycling and, uh, you know, the creation of Jen from uh, Graham's side initially and their contribution in writing books about Max, uh, which, uh, which are these two texts. This is uh, Gregory text, the step by step, and it's about adventures in sequencing. And uh, this is probably the hottest, newest release uh, we will mention for sure today, which is uh, generating sound and organizing time. And it's uh, primarily about coding uh, at a low level with Max uh, through Gen and a uh, little, little bit of uh, shout out for this work because uh, I particularly love Gen and I find great that there's a book which takes a DSP from a different angle. It doesn't just give us, uh, I don't know, the mere engineering uh, gaze on it. And it doesn't just give us the, you know, the basic uh, salt and pepper uh, lessons for making ring modulation, but it goes a bit further with a, with a very clear style. It's, it's, it's amazing. Uh, the meetup will start soon. Okay, can y'all see that? Yeah. Oh, well, yeah. so first, thanks for coming, everybody. It's great to see you. My name is Gregory. I'm uh, one half of this presentation. The other person is my friend Graham, um, oh. whom okay. Jen Tilda calls daddy. And all of you owe Graham a pint of Manchester's finest Dauber IPA at the very least. <laughs> and if you don't know why already, you'll figure it out as we go. So. Our job today is talking about Jen Tilda, Sample Level Signal Processing for Max MSP. The book we wrote, why we wrote it, what's in it, little sneak peek in book two, which is still coming. And we're gonna focus a little bit on pattern and insight. Uh, Graham and I are both gonna do a little bit of patching and uh, that's, kind of, that's kind of what's up. So since I don't know how much y'all know, um, I'm gonna start at the beginning. So what is Gen? Well, first, it's uh, Gen Tilde is an object that you can add to a Max or a Rainbow patch and do audio processing in it. It's a little bit like a sub patcher in the sense that you double click on a Gen Tilde object and you can see the audio inside. It looks a little the the uh, patcher window looks a little bit different than MSP, but not that much, and you can edit it on the fly. Patching in Gen tilde is basically like rewriting the internals in a, of an MSP object while it's turned on and running. And that means you can edit it down to the single sample level because that's how Gen does its work. And while you do that, Gen generates and just in time compiles native CPU code and sticks it back into your signal processing thing. So you can basically work down to the simple sample, single sample range without needing to use a uh, high level language like C++ and you still get the performance and you can hear what you're working on. So why would Gen matter? Well, here's, here's the reason Gen exists, pure and simple. This is impossible to do in uh, Max MSP. This is a really simple infinite impulse response filter. All it does is take one sample and average it with the one before that. The problem is you can't do that in MSP because you can't do a feedback loop for only one sample. There's a sort of reason for doing that, and I should just take a minute and talk about that. To make a program run fast enough to generate sound, you have to write pre-specialized code in a high-level language and then compile it, optimize it for the CPU. The problem is once you do that, the program is inflexible. It only does one thing. And if you want to change it, you have to stop, rewrite, run it again, which takes a lot of time. And occasionally, if you're a crappy coder like myself, it's no fun whatsoever. So to get flexibility at runtime, MaxMSP did something really smart. Every MaxMSP object, like the ones you see on the left-hand side of this patch, is built from specialized C code that only does one job and it does it really fast. So the black boxes are connected. There's a scheduler that controls that. And those flexible signal cables pass 
information back and forth. To stay efficient, that information is passed in chunks of samples, which in MSP we call signal vectors. The number of samples in a signal vector can be two to some large number, and some of you may have tried low signal vectors and noticed that things are kind of on its knees, but you can do that. But the problem is it's still two. So there's no way to run MSP shorter than a chunk of two samples at the very best. And there are a lot of things that you need for, you need single sample stuff for. Uh, feedback oscillators, all kinds of filter design, physical models, chaotic noise, that kind of stuff. So here's the deal. Jen came out of a really simple question. What about instead of lots of little islands of static code, you could compile the entire patch to one piece of efficient machine code and then have Jen running in the background, analyzing what you're writing, turning it into C++, optimizing it, and then sticking it back into the MSP signal flow. That's what Jen does, and that's why we all owe Graham a pint of something wonderful. The good news is you're not wasting any effort in memory buffers, global optimizations, but that also means um, there are some things to get used to about working in Gen. First, everything in Gen runs at audio rate, one sample at a time. All the patch cords are audio rate. The signals are nothing but floating point values, and every single object updates at exactly the same rate. The whole patch moves one sample at a time, which lets us do all that single sample stuff. And um, there's no such thing as message rate. That's one of the things that you kind of need to get used to in Gen. Um, there's also no order of operation ambiguities. Everything is updated one sample at a time. As you might imagine, since you're updating things that often, there are no user interface objects inside a Gen tilde patch because can you imagine how badly on your knees your system would be if you're updating stuff one sample at a time? Uh -uh, doesn't happen. So you have to have other ways to do that. And um, it's also continuously running. So you, Graham says you should think of that like uh, patching cables in a hardware modular synth. So there are some patching differences. The first one is you don't care about ints and floats anymore. Everything is a float, and the compiler does type inference for you on the fly. Um, that also means that arguments often replace inlets. That second example down there, you can see a multiplication object with two inlets, and the one on the right has 0 0.05 as the argument. That only has one inlet because that argument replaces the second inlet. That has and as an additional feature, the fact that you can use variable names, uh, parameter names in your patch and use them to do calculations, which is really, really nice. And you can use those smaller objects to make bigger stuff. Part of the reason for that is um, you can build libraries of sub patchers and abstractions, either the ones we provide in the book or your own with no loss in performance. So your, your abstraction runs as fast as any other gen patcher runs. The objects in gen, uh, gen tilde, there's a smaller number of them. Graham probably knows the exact number. I don't. It's in between one and 200, maybe, maybe more than 200. Could be, I don't know. But that's as opposed to 3,000 billion MSP objects. So you have far fewer objects to learn. And um, we hope that makes that a little easier for you to use. Gen patching involves coding. There is a language called Gen Exper, which is the thing that uh, Gen produces. And here's an example of it. Um, this is a Gen patcher on the left. And what we wanted to indicate is uh, there's a little uh, C at the bottom of that patcher window. If you click on that, it opens it up and it shows you the gen expert code which is being written by the patch you're working on. If you have any questions about what a line means or which object it is, click on the object, click on the line, and they'll identify each other. So you can actually take a look at how gen expert looks. There's also uh, the opportunity to write code because I know some of you are hardcore lovers of command line code. Um, you can write using the code box. Now, 
I just want to take just a minute and uh, talk about something that comes up fairly often. You shouldn't assume that using code in a code box is more efficient than what you can do with gen operators. While you may be very likely want to use the code box if you love coding, or more to the point, if you're trying to, to port code, once you know a little gen expert, you can use it for porting, but it doesn't run faster. What happens inside the code box is the same conversion that you get from connecting gen operators together. However, if you want to do any procedural coding, if, while, for, stuff like that, or if you want to control, say, the order in which you're reading and writing from a buffer, doing anything that's procedural like that, you have to have the code box. One of the things that we've tried to do is to um, write the gen book in such a way that the only time you'll see a code box is if you absolute, is we absolutely have to have it. We're not doing it because we think coding is stupid. We're doing it to encourage you to think about the idea that you can actually do the stuff in, in Gen tilde. And more to the point, you can't make a syntax, a syntax error patching in Gen tilde. The patch may not run the way you want, but you're not going to be hunting semicolons and the fact that you wrote you typed in mun, multiply instead of multiply or something like that. That stuff is not your problem. So um, we wanted to take a look at that. And of course, Gen can be exported in some form. The coming of Rainbow has changed the number of ways that that can be exported. Gen itself always can export as C++ code because C++ code is what the Gen object actually does in the background. So we can export that anyway. Or in Rainbow, you can use it with any number of targets. Rainbow is uh, in addition to Maximus P that arrived at the end of last year, around the time our book came out, and that shouldn't surprise you as being connected in terms of the dating. But basically, so there are a couple of places where that shows up. Oh, sorry. Forgot about that. Um, there's, uh, there's the DAISY patch, which is a way that we created the ability to take that C++ code and run it on the DAISY works great it's really cool and actually this is a little bit of an industry secret it is also at the heart of a something that sold really well the osiris oscillator that was actually developed in gen tilde so that's pretty uh, that's pretty darn cool i'll take a minute and talk about rainbow when we get to the end i can show you a little bit of what it looks like to export a patcher in uh, using rainbow later on but basically the idea is, here's the difference, the way to understand Gen and Rainbow. They both generate machine code. Gen tilde does C++, Rainbow does a lot more things, but they vary. So like MSP, what's in a Rainbow tilde object works in signal vectors, chunks of samples. Gen works one sample at a time. However, Gen works in Rainbow, which means all the Gen operators work, all the abstractions that we've made for you or you make for yourself work, work. the Gen code box works like a charm, and Gen in Rainbow still works one sample at a time. So that allows you to do great stuff. You can use var names to address parameters, and you can use polyphony to load single instances of an object in the way that you used to be able to do it, say, with the poly object in MSP. Oh, so the process of developing gen externals meant that we found that there was more that we could say about what it means to think in terms of work, working at the single sample level for processing and modular composition. And that's where the book came from. That's what this book is about. It's about the things you can do once you have a sense of what it's like to work sample by sample. And, um, we want to suggest how it's possible to reason about it, but also um, kind of demystify things a little bit. So this is the this is an overview of the Gen book. Feel free to blow that up, and you don't have to buy the book. But basically, what we wanted to try to do in the book is to help you develop design patterns and techniques, and also things to think with instead of thinking about tools of the mind to help you approach single sample level processing. In the course of doing that, we have done what we can 
to demystify a bunch of signal processing techniques and the way they're put together. And also, we've tried to provide you with lots of examples and abstractions that do common things. So in the sense that I think of an MSP object, how many people have basically see, asked for improvements on MSP objects that, that initialize it differently or do like some tweaky thing as its default? By virtue of working with abstractions in Gentilda, you can do that yourself. And so we've provided you with a whole bunch of ways to do that and to do it in a way that lets you hook things together and make sense of them. So I'd like to talk a little bit about what we think of as the, uh, what do you say, basic insights of the book, I guess. And we'll do it chapter by chapter. Uh, Graham will take this up when I leave you, and you'll be happy to see me go, I'm sure. But the, small, the first one is small is beautiful. We talk a little bit about the confusing thing about Gen is everything is one sample, and they're just flying by at scary rates of speed, and that's overwhelming. But it's not once you think about the kinds of the ways to think about those single samples, the ways of their ranges, their rates, their shapes, what they do, and we kind of run down a sort of bestiary of what those signals are. In addition to that, the number of gen operators that we use in this book is remarkably small. That little thing on the right, with the exception of the of math operators, uh, there is a crap load of this book that uses nothing but those objects. We use them to construct patches. And if there's a way to solve a common need, something you have to do all the time, then we pop that into an abstraction. We've included that in the book. So you can reuse those design patterns in different contexts. That's one of the things that Gentilda lets us do that we really, really like. And we've also tried to design things so that we have generators that uh, that produce things in, say, the zero to one range. So you can just like any place you have a zero to one phaser, you can just plug one of those bad boys in and see what happens. And uh, that's what we kind of want to encourage you to do. In addition to that, chapter two does the other thing that, man, we are just sure about in this book. We want to talk about thinking of time as something beyond counting, because that's certainly one, one way that we do time. But since we're musicians or since we're video people or installation designers, we're, we find ourselves often thinking of cyclic time, rhythms, oscillations, things like rotations. And we want to encourage you to think about using phaser ramps to, to do time. Why would you want to do this? Well, there's a humble little picture here at the bottom that I hope will explain a little what we're talking about. The top example is a, a metro object. It's ticking away, 0, 0, 0, boom, 1, 0, 0, 0, boom, 1. The trick is, if you're not getting the 1 out of it, you don't know where you are. How much did, how much time went past before the last, you know, the last tick? If you use a ramp, which you see at the bottom, you always know exactly where you are. And if you look at the difference between the current sample and the last one, you get uh, the famous slope that you learned in geometry, and that means you know how fast you're moving all the time. That means tempo changes and curves are precise, and it also means that you can do all kinds of modular time signal processing. That means like polyrhythms and, oh man, ratchets, you name it. Uh, and those things will all be sample accurate. And that's something we really want to talk about. So now comes the exciting, scary bit for me, which is the patch along. I'm going to um, attempt to uh, put together a, an algorithmic beat slicer in more or less real time. And uh, let's hope this works. Okay, um, let's put this away and put this away and I'll fire up my mix. Okay, now since we have very little time and I have to move quickly, um, I'm going to begin by using a snippet. Uh, for those of you who may not know what they are, a snippet is a way to create a piece of max patching that you use all the time 
that you can work from so you don't have to start all over again. And you'll find the snippets over here. Max comes with some of them. You can make your own. In the goodie bag, zip file, you'll find a file which I believe is called something like um, gen tilde underscore buffer play. That's what this is. So you'll see here's our here's our little dude here. Uh, this is the place this is the place I start working with buffers. And um, what that pretty much means is it's got the stuff I need to make noise. There's an easy DAC and the thing. There is a buffer. It's a currently it's a length zero buffer that's stereo, a message that lets me load a buffer. And here's my Gentilda object. And this is an adder UE. That is the way we accept that we access parameters inside the gen patcher. So I'll double click on this and we can look inside the patcher. Now, for those of you who are MSP people, some of this is going to look kind of familiar. As I said before, we're going to be exploring using phasers to uh, to basically do our timing. So we have a phaser that's running and it wraps zero to one. We have an object. Uh, we have a buffer called play me and we have a sample object. Now, if you're an MSP person. Hey, hey Gregory, sorry to, to, to jump in. Go. Um, do you want to do you want to zoom in on that patch a little bit? I don't know. Oh, it looks sure. pretty small on my screen and maybe it does on some of the folks. How's that? Is that is that good for folks? Is that good? Yeah, it yes. works from here. Right? Okay, cool. Um, so essentially, here's my buffer. Now, one of the things I want to do is set the speed of the buffer, and I used a param operator in Gentilda to do that. I gave it a name, BPM 150, and you'll notice that the adder UE, the adder UE object on the outside of my patch uh, already reflects that setting. So that's kind of that sort of helps. In order to uh, get that into the form that the phaser expects to work with, you divide it by seven by sixty to give you the frequency of the phaser because phaser expects a frequency. And uh, if you're an MSP person, you're probably accustomed to the peak tilde and poke tilde objects for buffer reading. In gen tilde, you have a number of options for buffer reading that are a little bit different, and you'll see one called sample instead. And so what I've done is sample play me, which is the name of the buffer we're looking at. And I've told it it's a two channel thing. So I got two channel output. I'm using sample for two reasons. First of all, the sample object takes the output of the one zero to 1.0 output from the phaser and uses that to index into the buffer. The second thing it does though is a little bit more important. And that is, let's see, how do we do this? If you are just reading through one sample at a time in your buffer, uh, you're not going to have a problem. The, the, the uh, samples in the buffer, unless you have a giant noise thing of some sort, are more or less next to each other. However, if I'm reading every 374th sample in the buffer, there's going to be a jump between one of those things and the other, and it's going to sound jagged and creepy and icky, and that's not what we want. So what the sample operator does is it performs linear interpolation. When it fetches a new sample, it adds the last sample to it, divides by two, and you get a lot smoother output, which is what we're going to want. So um, in order to do our algor algorithmic beat slicer, I need to set a couple of things up. First of all, I'm going to uh, set a number, uh, a number of beats for my, uh, for my um, patch. And I'll do that by adding a param object. Set it for eight beats. So the length of my buffer has eight beats. And I'm going to slice the buffer up. So I need to create a param for slices. And since I'm working with my patch, I want to add a couple of adder UEs here to do that. So I have access to those things. Okay, let's lock that bad boy up. And that means beats and slices. So that's all set up and ready to go. And what I want to do now is to um, add, 
for my phaser, I want to divide this value by the number of beats. And since I've got the parameter named beats, I can simply put in an object that's divide by beats. And I'll drop that in. And then for slices, what I'm going to have to do to play my slice back is I'm going to have to play a sixteenth of that slice. So that means I'll need to multiply my phaser by 16, the number of slices. Put that in. And if you look at my, if you look at my output, um, you see I have a slight problem. And the slight problem is the slice is moving too fast. In fact, let's let's load an audio file. And uh, turn it on and give it a little. I don't think that's what we want. That's going to that's that's too fast because we've set the number uh, of Gregory, slices. Sorry, uh, we can't uh, hear your sound. I don't know if uh, check the box. Oh. Huh. My, my sharing has the says I'm uh, got my audio on. Okay. Might that be related to? Uh, okay, hang on. The output on mass. Because uh, you should uh, check at Zoom audio driver. How's that? How's that? No, not yet. Um. Uh, can you check check on uh, audio status? Uh. And the options on Max. I'm sorry. Uh, oh yeah, sorry. Let's look at uh, options. Yeah, audio status, and yeah, you know better than me. <laughs> Zoom audio driver is the one you want to choose. All right, output device. Oh, Zoom audio device. There, there you go. go. All right. How's that? Awesome, man. We got it. Thank you. Great. Okay. Well, it's awesome, and now you can tell it's gone too damn fast. So. What I have to do to bring it back down to earth is we have to divide by that number of slices later on. Oh, sorry, I need this too. So, Graham, do I have to wrap in the wrong place? I don't know. Okay, hang on. So, here's what we've got now. Now, this is kind of this is kind of okay because what I'm doing now is I'm playing the first sixteenth, the first slice of my or the zeroth slice since we're computer programmers, of my buffer, over and over and over again, which is not very exciting. So. What I would probably really like to do is I would like to um, play a section of that slice back. And one of the ways I could do that would be to add an integer to my um, Oh, sorry, wrong place. I think in the, the book we had um, a wrap O1 yeah, also after the divide by slices. So there's two of them. Oh, sorry. The, the, the first one is kind of keeping the first one under control. And then, yep, you're right. You're right. Yeah. Okay, so let's let's fix that. This is good patch hygiene. Wrap zero one is really helpful to do. So, And we'll do another one down here. So the rep zero one is like whatever uh, whatever number you put into it, the output is always going to be between zero and one, and it's kind of doing it's doing uh, a Euclidean modulo, uh, which just means it's it's doing the same thing as like the hands of a clock on a clock face. Um, I'm saying the clock face, it'd be rep zero twelve. But, um, yeah, it'll whatever your input is, it'll rotate it back into being in the range that you want. Right. So, 
I want to be able to I want to be able to play back another slice. And in order to do that, one of the things that's going to be helpful to know is when I get to the end of this ramp. So I can create the ability to do that by adding a couple of objects. One of the objects I'll add is called Delta. Remember, we're working with single samples. So the Delta object just basically looks at the last sample you had in the current one and tells you what the difference is, positive or negative, between them. Then uh, since I may be looking with at some future point, I don't know, maybe, at ramps that start high and go low, I want the absolute value. So I'll take an absolute value of that. So that'll, that'll just give me the float value, and I'll test it. And the test will be, is it greater than uh, 0.5? Okay, and then uh, let's see. And just to make it a little clearer, I will take this out for the time being and connect this up here so you can see what I've got. So that's the end of that's the end of my. Or wait, or do I need this, Graham? There it is. So that's what you're seeing there. Every time the little teeny ramp ends, it kicks out a one. And I can use that one to trigger other behaviors. What behaviors might I want to trigger? Well, let's choose a section or a slice to play back. And to do that, I can use the latch operator, which is the rough equivalent of sample and whole, or SAH tilde in MSP. And so what you do is you feed the latch object with a test signal, which will be between 0 and 1. And then based on that, you'll uh, add that value in, which will move the, the sample you play back. And that will go in here. Now, how do I choose that sample? OK, so what I want to do is add a new parameter. And my new parameter is called jump. And since I want my parameter to jump by integers, in other words, I want to play slice 1, slice 2, slice 3, I'll use an object called floor. So I'll multiply the phaser output by the jump value, and then I'll take the floor of that. And what the floor object does is it takes a floating point value and it just kicks out everything to the right of the decimal point. So it gives us equivalent of an integer. And we'll collect that by our slices. And in our latch, and I'll have to add a, I'll have to add an adder UI to control that. Oh, I hate when I do that. Okay, we'll set that for jump. Okay, so with my jump set to one, sorry, I knew you'd love it, Graham. That was for you, buddy. Um, no, it's just funny. It's like it's it's one of those examples of you know you you you've done a tremendous amount of work and you've achieved what you had before, exactly. but that's not the point. The point is now there's a, <laughs> now there's a thing that we can modulate with it. Right, which is, something is going to happen. So playing jump one just plays through the sample. That means I can jump other amounts. So suppose we jump two. Oh, sorry. Oh, suppose we turn that all the way up. Okay, if I send... 
right? So what basically happens is if you've got an even number, then you've got a really regularly repeating thing. So six, um, odd numbers will cycle through slightly more interestingly. And negative numbers plays the slice back negatively. So there are hours of ridiculous fun here, but before I leave, I want to do one more thing. And that is, I would like to build a little randomness into my patch. I'm going to add another param, and it's going to, it's going to be called chance. I'll set it to zero when I start. And so what I'm going to do is to uh, take a random number. In the uh, gen tilde world, that random number comes from an, uh, an operator called noise, which outputs floating point values in the range of negative one to one. Right? So it's essentially a no, you know, an audio noise thing. If I take that noise and I multiply it by chance, what's going to happen is if chance is zero, then noise is going to be zero. If chance is one, then you're going to get a value between negative one and one. And I want to floor that, so I will sum it to what I've currently got by connecting it here. And here's what happens now. I'll go back to I'll go back to playing it one slice through. Now let's uh, add a parameter. Yeah, sorry, this does get a little boring. I apologize. I should have. Got some out tech room. Okay, so here's my chance. When chance is zero, nothing happens. If chance is at 0.5, half the time it will play, instead of playing the next sample, it'll play the sample right before it, or the sample right after it, or the regular sample. Presto, algorithmic beat slicer. And now it's time for Graham to do something even more fun. So Graham, it's all yours. Thanks. And I'll Graham. shut up now. Uh, Graham, we need your mic on. All right. Thanks. And um, now let's All right. Uh, thanks, Gary. That was awesome. Um, all right. So this so far, that, that's just like you know digging so far into uh, chapter two. There's um, the rest of the book up to chapter ten continues to uh, all different kinds of things from filters and delay effects and oscillators and granular synthesizers and chaos generators and so on. And, all kinds of things that are often they look like uh, you know if if they're plugins then they're essentially black boxes but we're kind of sh saying you know this is this is how things are um, this is how these things are put together really uh, and um, it turns out that many of these algorithms and sound processing techniques still come down to a pretty small number of common circuits and patterns uh, when you're working at the sample level. Um, simple algorithms that are reapplied in a variety of different ways. And so that's kind of the theme running through the book. Um, uh, for example, um, in chapter three, we talk about this really reusable idea of a unit shaper. It's just a way of mapping a zero to one range to another zero to one range, but through a certain kind of curvature. Um, but that very basic idea has got uh, a huge range uh, of different applications. You can use it to take those same uh, like phaser ramps that we were just seeing with the beat slicer um, uh, or other kinds of uh, tempo processes, and then just add curves to them, add swing to them. We can take a, a basic ramp and apply some wave shaping to generate um, oscillators or LFO shapes. And we walk through how to make uh, an LFO that can smoothly blend between 
uh, all of these different shapes you can see in this picture here. And it's, it's a pretty simple patch. Um, you can use it for making uh, different kinds of glides or slews, for pitches, interpolations, use it for envelopes and windowing. Uh, we use it for uh, wave shaping, um, a couple of different ways of applying it to bipolar uh, audio signals, uh, making harmonic distortions and how to separate them and so on. Working with it for random distributions or making uh, softer quantizations. Um, there's just a, so many ways they can be used. And then uh, we dig into unpredictability. We've seen noise, everything that comes from uh, noise, but also from uh, chaotic and uh, uh, unexpected uh, outputs of complex things. And Gregory has done a, a stellar job of providing a massive library um, uh, uh, of chaos algorithms here. Um, but also for things like um, controlling uh, chances, making uh, random walks and making them smooth, uh, uh, how to delve through non-repeating set selections. This is one of the examples where we dig into code box a bit more, um, uh, or kind of smoothing out a shift register, which is the thing down at the bottom there. Um, and in the process of this, all of these ideas that we're building, uh, we, we walk through building the patches, but then turn them into uh, abstractions that we then use again and again through, through the book. And so the book comes with this set of um, I think something like 190 uh, abstractions for things like ramp processing and unit shaping, random and chaos, logic, filters, oscillators, pitch translators. There's tons of utilities in there. And there'll be more in book two. Um, we continue on to looking at building uh, generative um, uh, sequencing patterns through uh, uh, by by thinking of melody as a sum of rhythmic transpositions, uh, step latch, uh, steps latches uh, that create complex undulations. Um, this kind of builds up to understanding uh, using um, uh, decoding a melody from a bit series, which seems really crazy, but it's actually um, super useful. Um, if you've ever played around with uh, Eurorack stuff, you've probably seen either the Turing machine or Mutual Instruments marbles, um, which are based on this idea of recirculating uh, a binary number through, through a circuit. But you can do a lot more with it. <laughs> Um, uh, and you can turn it into a random number generator and it's all it, and it's all right, or you can start doing like bigger shifts than just a single shift or shifting in more steps and so on. We also look at uh, Euclidean step rhythms um, and how uh, those are uh, kind of very easily understood as a kind of quantization of a line. So that's what this diagram is showing. If you look at the the steps in that line in the blocks as they go up, they're they're doing a three two two three two two kind of pattern, which is, and the the best even distribution of events in a period, which is what the Euclidean rhythms means. But then why stop at steps when you could also you know why why stop at ticks when you could actually be producing ramps? So we produce ramps from the Euclidean pattern, which you can then feed into unit shapers to make Euclidean LFOs, uh, and so on. It also turns out that the same modular arithmetic can also give you a pretty interesting quantizer. If you do Euclidean mod 12, you get like, um, uh, you can get uh, pentatonic modes or major minor scales or uh, uh, a bunch of other different um, actually really useful uh, patterns out of it. And then you can also apply the same principle to audio signals and you get some uh, kind of crazy smooth big crushing sounds. So this is, an example of one of the shift register processes kind of uh, feeding back on itself with a little bit of probability of change. And here's the, an example of the bit crushing um, effect, smooth bit crushing. Um, so you can control just exactly how harsh you want it to be. Um, it turns into a bit more of a wave shift. You can see the patch there is actually pretty simple. And uh, yeah, this is, so it's incredibly cheap as well. Uh, next, we look at uh, filters. Again, one of the kind of um, killer features for Jan is this single sample feedback that lets you build and design new filters. Uh, so we go through examples of how you turn a block diagram that you might find in a paper into a filter. Um, we we dig down on the the simplest kind of filter, the one pole filter. Um, uh, 
uh, a lot because there's an awful lot to unpack in what that really is. I mean, it's it's an integrator, it's a weighted average, it's an interpolator, it's also a, a translator. Um, and we'll follow in a little bit more of this in, in book two as we kind of drift it into things like dead reckoning and, and, and um, chemotaxis and, and, and so on. It blows my mind that these things are all kind of from one single origin. Um, we build a nice low pass gate. Uh, we go through some of the classic uh, filter designs. We dig into what trapezoidal integration is and zero delay filters and why they work. Um, uh, and then we also look at a variety of different slew and lag generators or smooth step generators um, and uh, why you would choose one over another. <laughs> the next chapter is kind of extending the same idea of the filter, like the, 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 the feedback filter. And then if you just add more time into the midst of that, you suddenly, you, you kind of have this span of huge range of different kinds of effects that all come out of uh, delay. Uh, so there's a, you know, this, this table is showing some of the different examples of just, you know, according to the delay time from long at the top to uh, to the shortest at the bottom and, and adding a bit of LFO and, 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 and math in there, you get this huge range of effects. Um, we also, we go into how to manage uh, the delay. Test. So a lot of things with the delay come down to what you stick inside of that uh, feedback loop. And again, here, you know, you with Dan, you get to play around. You can just try throwing different things in there and seeing what works. Um, and some of the common problems that might happen, so like filtering out DC or um, saturating if it gets uh, too much out of control and how lovely that sounds in combination with a filter. Um, how to remove clicks from uh, delay time changes, um, how to make a delay with pitch shift or without pitch shift, or if it does have pitch shift, how to control that pitch shift in a, in a musical way, in a precise way. Um, and then we dig into a little bit of uh, using uh, delays for um, physical modeling for string synthesis. We're going to go a lot more into that in book two and build uh, waveguides. Um, but uh, anyway, this is one of the examples. It's a really, really simple string synthesis patch, as you can see. Um, but the kind of fuzzy noise that's coming out of this um, it's really just because we're we're doing a little FM, little frequency modulation on the delay time itself, and it has this gorgeous kind of busy sound to it. I think it's just an example. Um, then we dig further into this idea of uh, modulating time uh, at audio rates uh, in chapter eight. We we look at amplitude modulation, ring modulation. Uh, what they and then what frequency modulation and phase modulation are, how they are related. Um, including kind of building up to this insight that um, they're kind of the same thing, except one is integrated and one is differentiated, which another way of saying that is that if you take the same modulator and high pass filter it into an FM patch, you get exactly the same result if you took the same modulator through a low pass filter into a phase mod patch, which is kind of crazy. And it's also interesting because those two things also fix problems. So the high pass filter on the FM will stop it from drifting out of tune, uh, or the low pass filter in PM will stop it from clicking if you have hard jumps in your modulator. We go into a bit of theory on sidebands and how to control them, uh, the common algorithms, but pretty quickly we get past the common um, FM algorithms because you can, right? Uh, you, you don't have to just stick to the usual, you know, cascade modulator, multiple carrier kind of things, but you can do feedback paths in, in there. Why not have two oscillators modulating each other? Why not throw some filters or um, wave folders in the midst of that, you know, uh, try it out. Uh, and again, how to fix common problems like, um, that the, the happen in there. And also there's a little section at the end um, that goes into working with um, harmonic oscillators um, so that you, if you don't want the inharmonic output of uh, mm. phase or frequency modulation, you can avoid it, um, but still get these smooth changes with, as you modulate index or other things. So I want I wanted to patch up a little example um, uh, of this. It's It's kind of, I, I like this patch a lot in the book because it, it, it's actually quite simple, but um, it does some pretty interesting things. So I'm just going to start. You should have in the goodie bag this starter patcher, um, although it's pretty basic anyway. 
Uh, let me check the, I have the right, I'm on Zoom audio device, so hopefully this works. Tell me if it, well, it's not gonna make any sound yet, so, but when it does, when it is supposed to make sound. Okay, so the first thing is I'm gonna make a, a, a sign oscillator and um, yeah, as Gregory said, I'd probably go a little bit fast because I know we're short of time. You can watch the video again and slow it down if it goes too fast. So normally, uh, in, a, in gem patch, you would use a cycle object to just make, make a sine wave oscillator, but we're going to dig inside what the cycle actually is. So instead of using a cycle, we're going to build it up from smaller components. We'll start with a phaser, and we're going to actually uh, take the sine of something. And the sine, uh, it wants radians for its input, so uh, we're going to scale our phaser by 2 pi uh, to give us radians, because that's what it expects and throw that in there. And um, let's give ourselves a parameter for, um, for Hertz. So let's start somewhere down there. It hurts uh, so good. Yeah. So did you hear that? Yes. OK, cool. And um, let's make it in stereo for now. OK. So that's, that's basically doing the same thing as what a cycle does. Actually, in the book, we also dig down and build a phaser as well. So you, you, you know what's going on there. So again, so that you can dig into what those things are really doing. Um, so for FM, typically you're going to want, um, or phase modulation, you're going to want a couple of oscillators. So uh, let's make another one. Uh, I don't know. Uh, we can make this um, 100 or something like that. Um, and throw it in there. And then if you are doing frequency modulation, then you're going to take some element of this and it's going to go up here and modulate the frequency of your phaser. If you're doing phase modulation, then instead you're going to dig in here and you're going to mess around with the uh, position in your sine uh, waveform. Um, in either case, what you're going to want to do, first of all, is scale that value by some uh, some amount, and um, we can make a, like, we can call it index, um, and we'll start it off at zero, and I'm just going to multiply index here, and throw that into my sign. So now, um, let's get our parameters up here, we've got our carrier frequency, we've got our modulator frequency, and we should have our index modulation there. So if I turn up the index modulator, right, basic FM sound, and it can be all inharmonic and horrible or lovely. It does those things. Okay. So that's very, very basic phase modulation. Um, John Channing um, suggested, uh, actually on the max form, uh, John, John Channing being the father of FM, so to speak, um, he suggested that actually uh, don't set separate frequencies for the carrier modulator, but um, have a common frequency and then set multiples of that common frequency uh, for your carrier modulator. So I'll do that. So I'll say param carrier uh, for the carrier uh, of one and param mod uh, two for my modulator. And then all I need to do is multiply those by our common base, um, which I'll just do like that. How's that? Let's clean that up. So now we should have, oh, yep, our Hertz is all good. Uh, let's see our carrier and our modulator. And one of the reasons for doing this is that I need to turn the index back up, don't I? If your multiples, if these numbers are integer, then you're always going to get harmonic relations. If they're not in an integer relation, then you'll get uh, um, uh, inharmonic sounds out of it. So it's a, it's a way of keeping things a little bit under control. So let's just tidy that up. Um, yeah, so one thing you may have noticed uh, is that 
If I mess around with this param, you might hear some clicks happening. And the reason why we're getting the clicks there is because uh, we are changing this number here that is being multiplied and being sent into our sign. Effectively, what we are doing is we're doing instantaneous jumps around in the sine, in the sine wave shape uh, whenever we scroll up and down on the params. So another thing. Um, Although the, all the signals in a gen patch are audio signals, they're all running at audio rate. The user interface um, on pretty much anything in a computer does not update to audio rate. Um, it'll update, uh, um, uh, who knows, like it could be uh, uh, every 20 milliseconds or every um, uh, 50 milliseconds or something like that. It's slow enough that it will, as you move, you're getting a stepped waveform out of it when you convert that to audio. Um, and that will cause clicks if you're using it to jump around in time. So there's a couple of things we could do. One of the simplest things is we could just um, smooth out our parameter uh, using some kind of filter. And we could use something that's built into Jan, like a slide. But I, I figured it'd be fun to show um, something, uh, something much simpler. I'm going to start with some noise. Let's get some noise. Um, I'm going to send it into a mix, which is just a crossfader between two inputs. And um, sorry for ears for a second. Uh, and then um, let's just have our param test over here, which is going to be zero by default. And um, let's get our test parameter up here. So I'll keep that quieter. So you've got some noise. When our crossfader is at zero, and as our crossfader goes up to, sorry, one, I should have put limits on that. In zero, at max one, there. We are crossfading between the noise and nothing, because I have nothing plugged in here. Um, the absolute simplest kind of feedback filter you can make is to take the output of your crossfader and feed it back into its other input. Uh, this is a way of saying, I am mixing between my input sound, which here is noise, and my previous output sound, which is what the history does. It's, the history is the object that gives us one sample of feedback delay. So now it's still noise, but as he crossfade across to the history, I don't know if you can hear this. It's not just getting quieter, but it's also getting filtered because the signal is getting averaged out and, and that effectively smoothings it out. It's a very weak filter. Um, you know, it's only a, what is it, a 3 dB roll off or whatever, um, but it's good enough for a lot of uh, situations. And in fact, if I just throw in a parameter over here and I'm gonna get rid of my test. So this is, I'm gonna use this as uh, you can see in the spectrum that it's kind of cutting down the sound a little bit. I'm going to use this as my filter for param index. And let's put our patch back in. So uh, my filtered index of modulation is now back to phase mod, is now over here. So. But now I can mess around with my index and the sound is smooth. No clicks. Um, okay, so let's just say I'm going to encapsulate this and I'm going to call it uh, that encapsulate, just turn it into a sub patcher. Oops. Okay, because we might need to use that again. Okay, cool. Um, so uh, next thing we could try is what happens if you take your, um, your, your sine oscillator and you use it to modulate itself. So instead of uh, modulating it by the uh, second oscillator, what if we just feed, back it, feed it back on itself? Well, again, I can't just directly plug this into the multiply because that would be an infinite feedback loop with no delay. But I can put a one sample delay in here and feed this back. And now I have a very different looking waveform. Let's have a look at the, 
Um, let's add one of these. Right. Although we're generating a sine wave, what we're getting out of here looks more like a saw wave. Yeah, I'll put that there so you can see that. And it sounds more like a saw wave, so a slightly softened saw wave, but it's a saw wave. And so this is like the simplest form of feedback FM. And if you mess around with the, uh, ooh, yeah. Let's make index have a min of zero. Whoop, min of nine, no, min of zero. Okay. So from our sine wave, as we increase the feedback, we got a nice like morphing between sine and sol. But if I push it too far, it gets pretty bad. Um, so the, um, the original Yamaha FM did have uh, um, uh, feedback FM like this, uh, or feedback PM as it really is. Uh, we can get a bit more control over that if we, again, throw a filter in that feedback loop. So I'm going to do this. I think we're going to need to control the frequency of this filter. Uh, at the moment, we just hard-coded it to this number of 0.99. Um, okay, so how do you set the frequency of, um, this is going to be a little bit of math that uh, we don't really have time to fully explain, but it is explained in the book. Um, but if you want to take your hertz and turn it into the crossfade factor, uh, first of all, oops, first of all, we're going to, we only want we're going to take the absolute value because we only want positive frequencies. We are then going to multiply it by minus two pi of a sample rate. Um, that is, we are converting a frequency in, uh, in Hertz. Uh, we're dividing by the sample rate, multiplied by two pi in order to get the radians per sample. And then we're making it negative because we're going to throw it into an exponent. And don't worry, it is explained in the book why that works. But that is the math that you happen to need in order to turn your crossfader into a free uh, a filter you can control with um, a specific uh, frequency. So if I put in param um, filter hertz, uh, I don't know, let's start low, and I'll put it in there. Okay. So now I can crank up. I can crank up my index a lot, lot higher now. We get a different waveform, um, but we also get kind of an interesting sound. I think it's nice. Uh, where's my filter hertz? Yeah, get mess with this. Okay, that's fun, but still we're doing stuff that Yamaha did a long, long time ago. Um, although they used a much simpler filter than this because they couldn't do feedback. Um, I want to try something that uses two oscillators, uh, but they are feeding back into each other. So we're going to just copy a little bit uh, what's going on here. Um, Let's take, in fact, we're going to need all of this. I'm just going to move that up like that. Let's copy this whole section. I'll make another one. Like so. And how about we listen in stereo for that? And then. All I'm going to do is instead of them feeding back into each other, I'm going to cross them over. So, so now we've got one oscillator modulating this oscillator, uh, oscillator which is modulating the first one in a, in a constant loop. 
And we're getting a more interesting waveform out of that. Um, the last thing I'm going to do is, um, this is not carrier modulator, so let's call it, um, uh, we'll call it frequency one, frequency two, and we'll do the same for this now. So, so we'll have filter one, filter two, so that we can explore what happens if we mess with each of these. Index two, oops, um, index one, and yeah. Uh, so then, just bear with me for a second. Let's clean this up. We got frequency one. We got index one, and we've got filter one. Um, and the same for two. And in fact, one more thing that I should have done: um, we can make these filters relative to our base frequency. So actually, let's make them also relative to the hertz. So they're not actually hertz, they are filter. Sorry for the mistake. Filter two. So now we have independent control of each one. That is filter two, and what does it sound like? It sounds like nothing. I've made a mistake somewhere. Oh, index is zero. And some pretty cool things can happen once you start pulling some of these down. Let's just make one of them really slow. Anyway, I invite you to explore that. Um, but I, I find this fascinating. It's, it's still a relatively simple patch, but it can really get into uh, some quite strange and organic uh, places. And um, I, I think we're, um, we're running late on time, so I, I'm not going to do the next bit. I was going to um, insert some wave shapers inside that feedback loop, because why not? Um, and I, I recommend that you try it, because it is a lot of fun. Uh, there's all kinds of steps. The, the, the key idea is that you're not stuck to just using like the preconce preconceived or the pre-discovered like um, circuits of what works with FM or PM, but you can try different things. You can try throwing uh, different processes in there and it is well worth doing it. It's well worth exploring. And um, uh, yeah, and you can hear the results straight away. So you can explore and find out what's in, what's in there. And I think that's, uh, for me, that's the thing that makes this whole thing worthwhile. Um, okay, let me go quickly back to the, um, to the slides just so that we can uh, um, cover the last little bit. So um, yeah, I've been talking through the chapters. There's a, there, there, there's, there's a couple more to go. There's one chapter where we dig a lot into um, kind of extending from the sample playback, but 
what happens if we start building sets of waves and then modeling like um, a, a wavetable oscillator um, and uh, not just like switching between waves, but morphing between waves and then morphing between different waveforms in two dimensional and then three dimensional spaces to get like this really complex modulations going on. And this is a perfect opportunity for us to talk about um, the problems of aliasing that come up once you are sampling from uh, a, a discrete set of data and you're trying to fill in the gaps in between or, or you're jumping over them too fast. Um, and we solved this with a couple of different uh, solutions in here. One is using a, a MIP mapping technique, which is borrowed from computer graphics. Uh, that is a, a way of essentially downsampling your data if you're trying to play it too fast. Um, uh, and then also using uh, sync interpolation to get uh, really high quality um, uh, sound output with a with a with a good uh, cutoff of the frequencies before they start to alias. Um, and the key idea being that the thing that you're trying to do into preventing al aliasing is to stop frequencies being generated that are too high in the first place. Now, you can't do it by filtering. You have to do it by changing your algorithm. And so we go through some of the methods of that. And we'll be going through more uh, in book two. Yeah. We also look at um, uh, wave terrains, which is kind of an explosion of the wavetable idea. If you imagine, instead of um, having, I don't know, like 100 waves in your wavetable, now you've got 100,000 waves, but your waves are all one sample long. Or another way is that you, you have a point, like your cursor, uh, like maybe it's a, a read head on a tape machine or something, but it is wandering in a two-dimensional tape landscape or a three-dimensional tape landscape and finding data as it goes around. Um, and it becomes really important then how you navigate through that data. That becomes more of what defines the sound. For example, if you take a narrow orbit, you'll tend to have a, a more filtered kind of sound. And if you take a much wider orbit, you're going to get a brighter sound. And so we go into an exploration of different kinds of orbits and how, how we can build them. And I think there's some example of the orbit generation in the, the, the goodie bag that uh, Gregory's prepared. Yeah. But like circular and diagonal and uh, polygonal waveforms. Um, and this is borrowing some, something from uh, a paper about polygonal wavetable synthesis, which is also in the Polygogo Eurorack module, if you've heard of that. Um, ah, here's some examples of these sounds. So you can see how the changing the, the, the radius of the orbit is um, changing the brightness of the sound. And then in the last chapter, we talk about um, uh, call it windows of time. We actually cover a lot of different things in here, how to do hard sync uh, and um, how to do uh, granular synthesis and how to do polyphony in a single gen patcher. Uh, and then finally building a, uh, a really cheap but quite effective band limited uh, oscillator right at the end. Um, and a, an awful lot of this has to do with how you manage um, not just making events sample accurate, but making them subsample accurate, how you deal with the positioning of waveforms um, in the, the, the spaces between samples so that the output waveform comes through uh, correctly. Um, uh, so this, it starts to get quite deep, but here's an example of this final uh, soul wave algorithm. And it's, we, we look first about why the alias is happening and explaining it in a purely time domain way um, and um, how you can solve it by effectively shifting the, um, the sampling grid that you're using to match the waveform that you're generating. So again, it's solving aliasing by changing the, the algorithm at the origin rather than trying to fix it uh, later. Um, and it turns out you could do this just by fixing one sample in the sequence. Um, and not only does it give you uh, uh, a pretty good soul wave, um, it's also able to support um, hard sync uh, oscillation, uh, even when the, the, the sync master is also uh, another crazy phaser at high frequency, even when they're under um, like high frequency modulation, 
Uh, and you can even apply some wave shaping in there um, and it still sounds great. So I'm going to play some examples. The hard sync. So you can see the patch is not so complex, right? Really like that patch. Um, and then the last thing we wanted to show uh, was uh, just really uh, quickly, if I can open this, it's uh, it's a, it's another patch um, which is it's it's using uh, granular synthesis and it is um, showing how you can dig into um, how do I explain this. I, it's it's a kind of uh, granular synthesis that um, you're effectively generating each individual grain and throwing it into the future and overdubbing a little bit like a um, kind of as if as if you had a, a tape driver um, with uh, you know a thousand uh, write heads kind of scattered forward in time on the tape. Uh, and whenever, and this one we need to use code books for because it, it, it's generating an entire grain at once, uh, which is appropriate for when you're working at a micro scale. Um, and so it's using things like if it's time to trigger a grain then calculate the properties and then step through all of the samples of the grain and write them into our tape. Um, and then uh, the bottom of the patch is really simple. It's just a tape reader that's playing them out and then erasing after you've played them. Uh, and then we had a little soft clipper down there because that's nice. Um, and uh, yeah. Here's what that sounds like. And this is spawning um, a, a grains at a rate that you set here. So individual grains. and. In glisten synthesis, each individual grain, you so because we're coding everything here, we can make the grain whatever we want. In this case, we've made a little sign sweep. So it's starting off at a high frequency and coming at a low frequency. Or if you reverse that, it'll do the opposite. And then we can control the amount of overlap here. I'm going to schedule that a bit faster. So the scheduler is here saying how many grains per second we are generating. Um, here we're taking care of the subsample location. If we didn't take care of this subsample location uh, of the uh, waveform, let me just, uh, can I very, very quickly show this? I'm just going to replace that with a zero. Um, hopefully, you'll hear the quantizing that happens, the aliasing that happens. Let's see if I modulate this a little bit. I don't know if you can hear it. Well, you can hear that. They're canceling each other out. I'm not sure if the aliasing is coming through for you, but uh, it's very clear to me. And if I put the fix back in. It should be now very smooth. Um, yeah, I just wanted to show that um, example of something that can get uh, a lot more kind of deep into the uh, into the patching. Um, okay, so the last thing is, um, uh, Gregory, do you want to take over and talk about the, the yeah, rainbow sure. stuff? Yeah, can do. Okay.
Okay, let me share my screen. So I wanted to show you what it looks like to uh, what um, exporting something looks like. So I thought what I'd do is I've provided you a couple of examples here, but the one I really want to look at is the um, beat slicer. So here's the beat slicer that we made. All right, it's a little bit cleaned up, you'll recognize it. And um, in order to do that, you basically drop it into a rainbow object. So the question, there's a couple of ways to do this. So the question is, you wanna drop this into rainbow, how do you access the parameters that you have and how do you handle the buffer? Because in other words, you're gonna have the buffer in your parent patch, a buffer in your gen patch, but what's in the rainbow object? So here is what happens when you drop this patcher into a rainbow object. Here's the beat slicer one. It's exactly the same patch. I've added out tildes for the outputs. I've put in a buffer with the same name as the, um, uh, come on, how do I move this? Can't get at that file crap. Uh, let me try that again. Oh, is your Zoom window in the way? Yeah, I think it is. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> um, so it's basically exactly the same. It's exactly the same patch. But you'll notice what I've done is I've taken and I've duplicated the buffer that's in here with this same name. So when I associate um, the buffer out here with what's in here, they'll identify with the same thing. So that takes care of that. There's a couple of ways to handle the parameter stuff. This is my favorite way to do it. You basically set a parameter with the same name as what's in your, what's in your parent patch. But, and here's some of the crucial difference. You have to add a min and a max range. Because if you don't do that, Rainbow will assume that the range is 0 to 1.0, which you usually don't want. So you'll notice that I've added uh, min and max values for all of my parameters and used the set object connected to the gen patch to do that. When you do that, then essentially um, what you do is you export it as a cold code thing. And let's see, put it on my desktop, uh, give it an object, give it a name, stereo beat slicer, hit the export, and basically what it does is it uh, uploads it and sends it to the cloud, and it'll sit there and work, but basically in order to keep this quicker because we're short for time, what I have here is an example of the beat slicer, which is, which is already uh, compressed. The goodie bag contains a copy of this. So those of you who are Max for Live users who can't edit, you know, won't be able to edit the patch, this will just run. So what you should do is in the, um, in the goodie bag, you'll find, you'll find something called Go Externals. Put that in your path name. Um, these should be de-sandboxed for both Windows and Max. I will apologize in advance if they aren't. But uh, that's pretty much how that works. Um, and uh, you'll, pr you'll find uh, some examples of that for not only this, not only buffer play, but here's the FM cross feedback patch. With some exciting presets. And it's basically, this is a compiled version of the thing that Graham patched. So you can do all kinds of evil things with that. You'll also find a polygonal oscillator like that. And one of the other things that I gave you, because it's just a mess to show you and it would just terrify you if I did it, is, is what I've done is I have taken all of the chaotic attractors that are in the book and I've compiled them as a single object. And so what this is, is this object contains every single chaotic operator 
that is in the Go book. And you can just basically load them and run them to your little heart's content at high speed. The only thing that I would caution you about is attractors demonstrate what is called sensitive dependence on initial condition, which means that if you do things like for some attractors, if you change the speed quickly, they'll blow up. Likewise, some of these attractors simply do not run well at high speed. If that's the case, I've built, uh, I've taken, uh, added an operator that takes not a numbers and reverses them to zero. So if you're running an attractor and suddenly everything flat lines, you'll know that's what happened. And I apologize. So step back the speed. And, you know, this is um, attractors, working with attractors like this is like speed dating. They all have really, really different uh, personalities and you just have to get a sense of them. These are all in the uh, negative 1 to 1.0 range. So if you want to use them unipolar, you'll need to rescale them, but they all just work. So this is X, Y, and Z outputs. This is the average of all three outputs, and this shows X and Y, that's X and Z, and that's Y and Z. So you can tell kind of what's going on a little bit. These are magnificent for um, formatting uh, for using instead of LFOs. The problem with an LFO, if the LFO goes like whoop, whoop, the third time it happens, everybody in the audience knows you're not doing it. And everybody knows when the next whoop is going to happen. This, this produces something that to my, in my experience, can be said to have something that resembles a kind of an intentionality about it. That's why I love them. And that's why I use them all the time. So that's, I think, all we have, right, Graham? Oh, no, 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 it's not. You want to give them a look at book two. Shh, I, I totally forgot. You may oh, want yeah. to know what's in book two. Please, yes. <laughs> Go, Graham. Uh, it's all yours, buddy. Uh, I think you need to come out and share a screen. I do. Go. Um, all right. I mean, it's just one more slide, so. Exactly. Um, yeah, I, there was there was so much that we wanted to cover uh, in the book, and the more we worked on it, the more we realized it was never going to be fitting in one book. Um, so we moved to book two. Um, some of the topics that were a little knottier or um, that need a little bit more build up. Um, the, the, there's things like more advanced band limit oscillators and upsampling and reverberation and physical modeling. Um, and we did develop some of those in book one, but book two is going to uh, well, it goes a lot deeper into these. But also, we wanted to dig into some uh, less conventional but still very powerful algorithms, like the stuff that you can do in an environment mm -hmm. like Gen that, you know, otherwise it's just inaccessible, um, including some of the stranger capabilities of sloped um, operations, uh, a lot of stuff on microsonic analysis and resynthesis or time domain analysis resynthesis um, in a, a kind of like the granular equivalent of that. Um, quite a few processes inspired by biological and natural phenomena uh, that um, are generally uh, absent from most uh, compute music materials. So uh, we think it's like super interesting. Uh, and so oh, yeah. hopefully you will too. We have a pattern okay. following algorithm based on the E. coli bacteria. Yeah. How the E. coli bacteria knows where to find sugar. It makes a really it's good modulator. It's just mind-blowingly <laughs> interesting. All right. Because, um, because an E. coli bacteria has like three, it has like three neurons and no memory at all. So how does it do anything that complicated? Yeah. You'll be really surprised. Turns out to be very close to the related to a high pass filler. Yeah. Um, it, anyway, so exactly we right. wanted to say, um, especially uh, thanks to folks who helped us um, put this book Amen. together, especially uh, Darwin Gross, uh, without whom yeah. it would never have happened. And his editorial Amen. spirit lived on after his passing. Uh, also folks like Michael Zabinski, Corey Metcalf, Isabel Kaprisky, uh, 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 Jim O'Rourke, uh, Luc Dubois, uh, Robert Henke, Sean Booth uh, for their detailed reading and reflecting on the book and its patches. And thanks to the amazing um, uh, folks that have uh, given us comments and feedback and um, yeah, uh, really nice vibes uh, after the book was released. So yeah, uh, that's it. Uh, thank you both. Uh, this was 
uh, great. <laughs> so, I think thanks for right, drinking from time. <laughs> really, thanks for drinking from the fire hose, everybody. Lordy. Um, yeah, it, it was awesome, uh, and uh, I, uh, I I was smiling when when I when I heard about the attractor part because I had quite a hard time when dealing with some chaos functions, and then I realized you need just to slide those numbers down if you want to not blow up things and it's gonna work amen yeah <laughs> that's um, it that's that's what that whole sensitive dependence on initial condition thing is yeah. about yeah do you go uh and um so i collected uh, a bunch of uh, questions as some others are probably coming over we will try to make the best out of uh, the time left uh, uh, the first one comes from Jim, and he asked, uh, uh, talk about validating and testing, testing techniques in Jam. In Max, it's easy to add a message or number box to validate output as you build a patch. This seems harder to do in Jam to validate objects, connections within the patch. Yeah, it's uh, it's true, and it's um, it's partially in relation to what uh, Gregory said earlier that because this is a a sample by sample environment, uh, we can't have message rate processing in there. Um, and uh, uh, usually, the first thing I recommend is when you start working, immediately create a debug output of your gen object yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, or a several. Um, like I, I think it's almost the first thing I do is I say like out five debug um, and just you know I'm using it all the time and sending those signals.